What is this gross yellow crap that's growing on top of my toenails? Why are my feet always dry? What is that smell? Well, we'll answer all these questions and more on today's Podiatry Explained. Hey guys, Dr. Kilfoyle here. Today on Podiatry Explained, we're gonna be talking about fungus. Uh, you know, a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions about it. It's something that I see every day here. I explain this through and through with probably 10, 15% of my patients, new patients. And, uh, you know, I have to kind of get over some of these people's misconceptions uh, before I can even start talking to them about what the reality is about fungus. You know, it, first off, it's not caused by uh, poor hygiene. A lot of people think like, oh my God, I'm so gross. Oh, this is fungus. And they feel, it feels very, very, uh, you know, they're not very happy to hear that. Um, I, a lot of times it's caused because the foot is in a dark, wet, warm environment. Construction workers, kitchen workers, they just have these occlusive shoe gear. It's nothing that they did wrong. It's the dermatophyte, derm meaning skin, fight meaning plant, um, fungus that is literally ubiquitous. It's everywhere. You can't avoid it. And when you have a foot, uh, an air, a foot that's in an area where it's hot and wet, you're going to get it on, to, you know, an infection. It's going to happen. Um, so let's just go through a typical scenario that I see. Um, so patient comes in with a chief complaint uh, with changes to the toenails and dry skin on their feet. All right, so how do we diagnose this? Well, we can diagnose these fungal infections many times with just the clinical presentation. Um, this quote unquote dryness that is really not dry skin at all. Uh, these little circular scales, and I'll show you on a picture here, uh, th this is evidence that a fungus is growing outward from this essential area. With enough of these circles converging, sometimes you get these little curving lines or what we call serpiginous, snake-like uh, lines of scaling. Uh, on the feet, there's areas with more keratin, so it's more easily affected. There's more for the fungus to eat. So the scaling distributes in the area of, the, of where the keratin is thickest, and that's what we call a moccasin distribution. It's distributed in all the areas where a moccasin would touch your foot. So the dermatological way to diagnose it clinically is annular or serpiginous scaling in a moccasin distribution. There's your $5 word for today. All right, so when it comes to onychomycosis, which is the fancy $5 word for fungal nails, onycho meaning, fung uh, onycho meaning nail, mycosis meaning fungal infection, that's when there's a fungus on the toenail or the fingernail. Um, the diagnosis is pretty much just done by looking at it. Um, if it's thickened, yellow, or brown, uh, it's most likely fungus. There's a few rare exceptions. Um, like one of the ones that are, one, one exception could be like psoriasis. If a patient has a history of psoriasis, it may not be fungus. Um, if there is any doubt, we typically take a sample of the, the nail and we send it off to a pathologist. What is fungus anyway? So fungus is an organism. It's uh, its own class of organisms off the tree of life. We have bacteria and animals and plants, and we have fungus, which is a whole nother set. Uh, it's actually genetically more similar to humans than it is to bacteria, which actually makes for some challenges for when it comes to treatment of it. Um, it's because the things that, used to, that are used to kill fungus uh, can also harm our cells as well. It's, it ha that happens because of how similar our metabolisms are it's a lot easier to kill a, a bacteria because our metabolisms are so much different and there are components of the bacteria organism that humans do not have so we could target those things and make sure that we reduce the amount of harm that is done to our human patients or animal patients uh, there are many types of fungus that infect humans and in this video we're going to be talking about uh, the one that the most commonly affects the skin and nails trichophyton rubrum uh, or as we like to call it t rubrum uh, for short so T. rubrum is a dermatophyte, which, you know, as we said before, means a skin plant. T. rubrum literally colonizes the dead portion of your skin and eats the proteins produced by enzymatic secretions in your skin. So T. rubrum, T. rubrum and other dermatophytes must take, make direct contact with your skin to infect you. Uh, it's usually some mild abrasion uh, is present on the skin and other factors like moisture and anatomic location help to determine how readily that fungus actually is going to infect your, your body. 
you make contact with fungus uh, almost anywhere. And it's uh, so ubiquitous in nature, it's hard to avoid. I'm talking about water parks, public showers, uh, maybe even hotels, even in your own house where there are other infected people, if you're walking barefoot on the same floor as they are. Uh, dermatophytes are transmitted uh, by direct contact um, with an infected host or by indirect contact with, you know, shed skin on fomites such as clothing, uh, brushes, theater seats, baseball caps, bed linens, shoes, uh, towels, hotel rugs, bathhouse, lo locker room floors. Uh, also, the transmission could just be from soil to skin. It doesn't have to come from another person. This, this stuff is everywhere. Um, some, of the, some of these organisms can be viable in the environment for up to 15 months. You can be sitting there hanging out, living off of stored energy for 15 months, and it'll be okay. So what are the most common infections? Well, the most common ones include the feet, which is called tinea pedis. Tinea meaning fungus, pedis meaning the feet. The creases near the hip, also known as jock itch. The scalp, tinea capitis. Tinea fungus, capitis meaning head. Uh, this, the hands, tinea manum. I'll let you figure that one out and uh, the nails, onychomycosis. So let's talk about treatment. So there's a lot of fake remedies out there that take advantage of people's lack of knowledge about the topic. And there are also medications that have been proven to help um, using scientific research. And these treatments have, a varying, have varying degrees of efficacy. And some of the most effective treatments have been, I would say, slandered uh, for being so harmful to humans that they need to be monitored very closely. And I'm gonna challenge anybody who thinks that you should be regularly testing your blood for when you're on these medications. So let's talk about that one first, because this is the one that actually is the king. This one, according to all the studies, is the best way to get rid of it the very first time. It's over 75% effective for a complete cure. Not clinical cure, not mycologic cure, complete cure, 75%. And that's with a 90-day course of one 250-milligram tablet of terbinafine. Terbinafine, also known, or, you know, its brand name being Lamisil, uh, is now generic. Uh, it's relatively cheap compared to some of these other medications that are out there. The thing is, is that um, people have this preconception that it's bad for your liver. And uh, it's, there has been some recent research that some doctors may not be aware of that have uh, disproven that, but the, the legend remains. Um, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. Since it was introduced in the market in the early 1990s, doctors of all stripes prescribed the medication with caution, um, with liver function tests. Doctors would and still do blood work looking for higher than normal AST, ALT, alkaline phosphatase, creatinine clearance, um, albumin, other markers for liver function to confirm someone is healthy enough to metabolize the medication safely. Uh, prior to terbinafine existing, the only real oral medications that people were taking were azole type antifungals. I'm talking about diflucan, fluconazole. Um, th those azole type antifungals are directly hepatotoxic. That is proven and ought to be monitored. Um, but when the new one came out, well, I'm not gonna give my patient this new oral antifungal without monitoring them. It makes sense. This led to a cultural instinct to follow the same lab work that, you know, the lab work protocol for the new alilamine to benefine, and as well, you know, as similar to the other azoles like diflucan. Uh, so in 2017, an article in JAMA Dermatology, and I want you to realize JAMA Dermatology is one of the most prestigious, one of the most well-respected journals that exist on the planet. Okay, JAMA. If you don't believe it, go look it up yourself. Here we go. Dr. Stolmeyer et al. found that the rates of AST, ALT, and other possible adverse events in people taking terbinafine were low and equivalent to the baseline rates of abnormalities in the same population not taking terbinafine. And concluded that, quote, abandoning frequent laboratory monitoring can decrease unnecessary healthcare spending, decrease patient psychological angst associated with blood draws, and allow for expanded use of these effective oral medications. Do you, I need to say anything else? Of course I do, because nobody believes me. I'm saying, unless you have a history of hepatic disease, you have jaundice, have you ever had jaundice in your life? Have you ever had hepatitis? Have you ever had cirrhosis? Have you ever had any congenital liver problems? Any fatty liver disease? Anything? No? All right, you're a candidate for the medication. No, you don't need blood work. I won't gotta give you blood work. Why waste your time? Why waste your insurance company's money? Why bother? If you, if you know, if you, if you prefer it, 
whatever. Go ahead. Here, knock yourself out. I'll call you when the results are normal. Um, that's not to say that there are no risks for side effects. Um, side effects do happen, uh, like with all drugs. Um, the risk of adverse effects between tubinafine and placebo was found to be non-statistically significant in a meta-analysis published in 2018. Um, so pretty much, you're gonna, most typical ones are GI-related uh, stuff. Sometimes people get muscle aches, uh, headaches, uh, loss of appetite, things like that are gonna be more common ones. You see some rare ones, you know, if you looked up hard enough, you find people who are losing their hair from it. Uh, we are going to treat with not only the oral tibinafine, or if we were to do a topical like Jublia, which is the best topical known to man, maybe keratin, uh, use Tosalin a lot. Uh, it's a over-the-counter type of situation provided by, prescription, by physicians only. Um, you have to concomitantly treat the tinea pedis as well unless you want the tinea pedis to come and reinfect your nails. You wanna attack the fungus from the outside and the inside in a perfect world. Uh, at the very least, you're gonna use an antifungal cream. Here, the azoles are perfectly capable of, of taking care of it. So I'm talking about clotrimazole for my Medicare patients. I'm talking about ketoconazole for my private insurance patients. And then if uh, somebody is not really responding to it, I'll use an alilamine type uh, antifungal topical like uh, naftin, uh, naftaphine, and that'll be something that's uh, going on here. So when you have tinea pedis that's really, really bad, uh, and the body is exudating lots and lots of fluid because the tinea pedis has ulcerated the skin, we call this interdigital maceration or interdigital tinea pedis. Here we have a good video of it. Here this guy has been putting starch onto his uh, <laughs> onto his feet. Uh, to help dry it out, and when we put on the uh, the iodine, it turns purple. I, I'd never seen that reaction, I guess, in chemistry class, so I, was, I had to look it up. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, but you can see in between his toes that skin has turned white and wet and macerated, it's called, um, and it has opened up. So this guy, we have to not only treat his uh, fungal infection, but we have to prophylactically prevent a cellulitis from bacteria we call that a cellular uh, you know a bacterial super infection the, the the infection here is the fungus and above that is the bacterial infection and that is the dangerous part there's been plenty of patients just like this that i've taken care of in the hospital who uh, end up being on iv azole antifungals having daily blood, blood draws for their liver function test uh because they're admitted for cellulitis and they're being treated the infectious disease doctor is leading the, the, the the treatment for the azoles, discharged on terbinafine, of course, and the patient uh, has to be, stay in the hospital for like a week. Uh, MRIs to rule out uh, abscesses, it's an absolute nightmare. So I really aggressively go after this. I uh, typically will use betadine splintage. I will splint these toes away from each other to allow for the maximum amount of absorption by this gauze um, and allow this ventilation to kind of be there. Um, the, the betadine will have a uh, antimicrobial effect to it. I will start having them treat the athlete's foot with either gels or creams or the tibinafine oral medication, which w does work on the skin. Uh, the important thing though is why is the foot getting so wet? And a lot of times hyperhidrosis is the cause. Antiperspirants, like the one that you use under your arm, uh, is just fine. It's the same exact chemical that's used in the wipes or the uh, uh, the prescription stuff, just go over the counter and buy the antiperspirant. We use it once every, uh, every other day and your feet won't sweat as much, so it'll reduce the chances of this coming back. Um, here we are just gonna see a video of a guy with significant onychomycosis. You can see this is what happens when you don't cut your nails. This is what happens when you don't treat the fungus. The nails get thick. They look like slabs of butter on top of people's feet. Uh, it's, it's very, very, um, painful uh, in shoe gear and this guy he must have not cut his toenails for like five years or so um so thankfully i have the tools to take care of this and you see me just knock them out real quick it's not really a big deal to me um but you shouldn't let this happen to you in the first place so here we're looking at a slide uh made by this piece of nail that was sent off Clearly, clinically, you can see that there's plenty of uh, onychomycosis in this. There's plenty of nail that is infected with, uh, with, with the stuff, with the bad guys, the trichophyte rubrum. And what they do is they, they put this into a, um, a wax box. They, they, they kind of 
embed it into wax, and then they use a microtome to cut little slices it out of it. And they use something called P uh, KOH to dissolve all that keratin material. So all that's left is this stuff. And they use different stains to make these different colors pop out. Now these this red fuchsia color is the color of uh, things that are being stained by the like the pretty much the cytoplasm of the different cells that exist there. And this darker purple color of uh, this basophilic stain is things that are uh, have a lot of uh, new, like a big amount of DNA in it. And so these purple things, you can see these are all the mold that was existing inside of there. So there's plenty of candida or a, a mold material that lives inside of here where you see these little hypha, you see these uh, little almost like root-like materials that are there. Those are, that's the trichophyton rubum, most likely. And uh, it is, these are septated hypha, which is just a fancy word for uh, root systems with little septa uh, or little, uh, little walls between their cells. So we have uh, here a lot of candida, mold, all this dark purple, and all these septa are, and you can see one cross section, are going to be your trichophyte, which is the more common cause of onychomycosis. Here we have one, which is our PAS and Alshin blue stain. Here's a little bit less of a uh, uh, of an infection of the nail clinically, but here you can see the trichophyte rubrum, as he described, is going to be these septate pieces of hypha, as you can see here, and the mold, the non-dermatophyte species, are going to be all this purple stuff this really, really dark stuff. So these are pigmented molds and the more commonly found trichophyton species. Um, so if there's any questions, guys, any questions, comments, concerns, quibbles, small remarks, please put them in the comments below and I'll answer them. Um, and just remember, every day is the best day of your life.